I woke up at 5.30 this morning and checked the radar. I checked the radar early Sunday morning. And uh, I don't know if you checked it this morning or not, but uh, we just, we've just we been praying for a good day. And uh, when I checked the radar this morning, there was going to be kind of a, a short shower about 7 o'clock. And then all the clouds just part north and south. Just north and south. And I just had to praise God for that uh, because we've got a lot of food for you today. In fact, we have a new menu item on our picnic barbecue. We're having corn today. All right? And uh, so, you know, as we kind of looked at that this morning and then what I've been just tracking with throughout the summer is just a number of things that God's been doing in people's lives. We've gone some people and families within our church family have gone through some difficult things and yet we're seeing God's glory and his majesty and so many things that we can only say God has done this. In 1890 was the founding of Oxford Baptist Church and those dear people, those founding members, about 40 of them believed that the mission of the church was to witness to the west side of Woodstock and be a mission to the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And down through the decades, we have seen the faithfulness of God through faithful men and women in this church who have just served him, loved on one another, and loved the community. Can you imagine that in 1890, who was the reigning monarch at that time? It was Queen Victoria, all right? And then Edward VII, George V, Edward VIII, who abdicated, then George VI, and then dear Queen Elizabeth on June 2nd, 1953. And most of us have only known her. There's some of you who maybe knew Queen Victoria. I don't know. And now we have King Charles, and then in a few years, King William, and then King George VII. And there were some people complaining that they're not going to see another queen in their lifetime. But we've been blessed by the example of this queen whose faith in Jesus Christ made an incredible difference in her own life and character. For her to reign was such a godly example through all those years and through all the stuff that she's been through in her family. You can't help but say that Jesus Christ was working in her life. She had numerous visits with Billy Graham. She had numerous visits with John Stott, another uh, amazing pastor in England, and num a number of others she had a, a, such a way with her, and we're thankful for that example. But we are in a time just like in 1890 and during the First World War, the Second World War, um, through the Cuban Missile Crisis, through other recessions, all of these things, we are in a time of great change. So we need to be solid in what we believe and how we are to live in light of the gospel. And her example is one of those great examples on the earth that we're thankful to God to see. At the start of the year, we need to review our why. What is the purpose or why are we here? What's the purpose of Oxford Baptist Church? And, and we understand that a relationship with Christ changes everything. That's kind of our church-wide motto. But the mission of every church is the same. And if it is not the mission of a church, I can tell you very clearly that church will not continue to grow. It will just decline because we get caught up in a lot of woke fantasies and a lot of theology that really is not biblical. Because the mission of every church is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Our mission is very clear then. That Oxford Baptist Church exists to glorify God by making disciples who love one another and share Jesus Christ with the world. 
And Jesus gives us a very clear strategy, doesn't he, in the scriptures? I want to read them again. It's kind of like a, you know, a football coach that kind of starts off the beginning of the year and says, you know, uh, gentlemen, this is a football. This is the field. These are the lines that you can kind of live within and play within. And Jesus gives us this in the everyday commission that he gives in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, where we are to make disciples who can make disciples. And as Jesus says this, he says, therefore, go and make disciples, notice this, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's interesting what Jesus says there. I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Why is he with us? Because we are, want to be a church that is making disciples. And when churches are making disciples, they can be guaranteed the manifest presence of Jesus Christ in their life, in their work together, and in the ministry together. And we accomplish this mission through a balance of winning the lost, as Jesus did, building up believers, equipping workers, and multiplying leaders. But we are to do it in love. In Mark chapter 12, is just one of the occasions where Jesus talks about the, the greatest commandment. And the greatest commandment is so important for us to, to understand and to be reminded of that as a result of Jesus Christ calling us into a life with him through Jesus Christ, we are called into a life where he says, love the Lord your God first with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. One commandment, two parts. We can't say that we hate our brothers and sisters or our husband or our wife and say that we love God. We can't say that we don't love God, but, but, but we, we love all these other people. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we are given this incredible, incredible everyday commandment to live out in our lives, to love the Lord your God and to love those around us. See, we're excited to help people find their way back to Jesus Christ, who is their creator. He created each one of us. And we're also excited about making disciples who want, uh, love one another. And when I first came here in that kind of first six months, we sat down as an elders board and staff team at that time to, to, to work out our church ministry priorities. And I, I, I'm, I'm excited that I'm starting my eighth year with everybody here. Eight years. Some of you go, that's way too long. Some of you say, boy, that really went fast. But you know what? When our church ministry priorities are clear, and we see them in Matthew 28 and Acts chapter 2, where the early church just had these priorities. And, and we set five to seven ministry goals under these priorities each year, that we are guided by the Holy Spirit as God's people, as we're filled with the Spirit of God to obey him as a church family and leadership team. Our first priority under the power of the Spirit of God is worship and prayer. And, and the, the catchphrase there for this is honor God by seeking and treasuring him together. Or just, we just want to honor and treasure God. And then there's fellowship, love, and compassion. You see this through Jesus' life, and you see this in the early church, where we want to cultivate an authentic community that serves with joy and compassion to people around us. And, and, and the short phrase there is just, cultivate loving community and then we want to be a part of an outreaching and an evangelistic church where we go and share the gospel for kingdom impact both here in oxford county and around the world so we just say just go and share go and share and then we want to disciple people discipleship in the word of god equip god's people to know and respond to god's word to equip god's people we also established back then, and what we're seeing in a greater way that's happening are these uh, Oxford church values, 
We've looked at our past. We looked at our present. We looked at, towards the future. And our values, we want to be very clear about. We want to experience God's presence with us. Not our presence. Not all about us. We want to experience God's presence. We want to have solid biblical preaching. We want to be community-focused, multi-generational. And, and that's so important when the church in North America has segmented so many people in the church. We, we want to have clear segments of discipleship for children, youth, and adults. But we want to have things together that help us all understand that we are in it together and that we can learn from one another as we do this together with loving compassion for people as one of our church values. Our big vision goal that we set was to impact 3,000 people with the gospel, both in here in Oxford County and around the world over the next five to 10 years, locally, regionally, and globally. And what's amazing is that we're starting to see that increase as I hear stories about people having opportunities to, to share Christ, whether it's with family or coworkers or neighbors. And the amazing thing that we see in the early church is that in Acts 2.41, those who received his word were baptized. So when they trusted in Jesus Christ, they believed in Jesus Christ, they were baptized and they were added uh, to that local church and they belonged. As a result of that, they began to behave more and more like Jesus and then they began to break out in ministry together. To believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, to be baptized into the name of Jesus, to belong to a local church in Jesus Christ, to behave like Jesus Christ, and to break out in ministry and, and mission like Jesus. Today, I just want to thank our staff and volunteers for the last number of months through all the pandemic shutdowns, the openings, and all the crazy things that we've done as a church. Being out here, all the setup, all those people who help us. But now I believe we're moving into a new era where once again, we need every member of the body of Christ serving together and following through with this mission because every member of the body of Christ is a minister. This morning, I, I want to just touch on our building project and and our, our theme for the building project is transformation for generations, a heart for Oxford County and the world. A couple of weeks ago, I watched as uh, a number of our young guys pushed uh, our praise wagon into the barn over there. They got it all lined up, and I was just watching them. I was too weak from preaching, I guess. And they were having fun. They were just having fun. And then they rolled the wagon up right to the edge, the hump going into the, the garage, and they couldn't do it. And I thought, maybe they just need me. All right? Then I don't know who said it, but they said this. We just need one last push to get it in there. One last push. I don't know about you, but I like last pushes. And they pushed our praise wagon back up into the barn. They got over the hump. We just need one last push. You know, football season will be starting soon. And I always am amazed at the linemen, you know, who are 300 to 9,000 pounds. And they're at the goal line ready to score. And you can just hear them. We just need one last push to push the ball over the line. And so those linemen who've been eating more than what they should, at that point in time, they make history by pushing their running back over and making a way to get over the line. In a battle, there's always a last push to bring about victory. In hockey the sport that was directly given from God to this country. There's one last push 
to tie or win the game, the extra effort. We've been seeing that especially through our women's hockey program. And then when I was talking to the campaign team, I didn't know whether I should use this illustration or not. But women giving birth, the doctor, the, the midwife, the nurse says, just give us one last push. And the baby's born, right? Our building project over the next few months needs one last push to get us over the hump so that we can get the building completed on our new property. Yeah, materials, there's, it's going to be hard to order some, steel, concrete. All of those industries are behind. But we're continuing to move ahead to get building permits, finish up the, the, the excavation, but we need more funds. At our semi-annual meeting, Rob Cole, co-chair of our building uh, team with Jeb Bigham, gave us an excellent presentation of where we are at, at our building project. The costs have increased $874,000. And before that, that's about all we needed to get started. So that's doubled since then. Some prices have gone down while others have gone up. And that, uh, that meant our new goal at June 1st, 2022, was $1,608,687 with that increase rather than the 800000 that was left to go. We're just living in times like this, and we understand what's going on. But did you know that just over the summer, we've raised another 60000 over the summer without much fanfare? It's just been coming in. And a few things, a number of things that have come in over the last couple of weeks. Now, a couple of weeks ago, one of our grandmothers in our church had her granddaughter out here with church with her. And they went home for lunch after the service. And the granddaughter said to her grandmother, Grandma, do, do, does your pastor teach tithing or giving at the church? And she said, well, why are you asking me this question? Yeah, he he talks about that, and he says, well, she says, I, I came to your church, and I hope more people are going to give so they can get real washrooms out there. Isn't that an interesting statement? Our campaign team has met, and over the next number of months, we're increasing our prayer focus for the project every Sunday, our prayer emphasis in our groups, our Thursday morning prayer time. Once we get back to the school, we're just going to have a half hour just straight prayer time for the service the next day and just time to pray. We're going to be putting some weekly prayer reminders in the mailer and, and twice monthly updates as well of where we're at in this new goal of $1.6 million. We are going to ask you to pray, to listen, and to give. And we'll have a new promotional card just on the final push. And just a brochure that will give you kind of 101 ways to give to the project so that we can just be a people that are faithful to God and see God at work. Just like this morning, God knew our need of having a clear day today. And we'll be giving plans, give you plans and opportunities for opportunities to give as well. well we're going to be having a Christmas banquet, dessert auction on December the 3rd. Our 132nd anniversary service on November the 20th as well. But you might say, well, I, I need help just learning about finances, and we will be having a financial course just to help people get a grasp of that in a biblical way. So we'll be contacting people and connecting people over this while. You see, I, I'm so thankful for what God has done through his people already. During this COVID time, with the sale of our building and all of those things, we've raised 
$3.6 million. That's amazing. We've been approved for a mortgage up to, I think, $1.5 million. And uh, we haven't even used any of that yet. And hopefully we don't. But this, the amazing thing is that there are sometimes just little ways in which we can be sacrificial. And when I look at the parking lot, no one is driving a Model T to church. In fact, I don't think we have anybody who's, uh, you know, driving a 1970s boat to church because they were all like that back then. God's prospered us in many ways. So here's one illustration of what can happen. I'm calling this illustration, or one of the 101 ways to give, is make your coffee at home. Make your coffee at home. If you go to Starbucks, those drinks, this is one of the cheaper drinks. I'm calling it the Cinnamon Dolce Latte Tall, for those who go there. It costs $3.65. If you take that drink five times in a week, and let's say 30 people from our church do that each week, times 52, that's $28,470. Now, you might be a Tim Hortons person. And uh, coffee there, on average, is $1.99 times five times a week. And we have a few more people that drink there because I've seen some of you. Times 40, times 52, is $20,696. Imagine that. Some of you are more smarter and go to McDonald's because they have the original Tim Hortons coffee there, but they still charge $1.99 on average. Times 5, times 30 people, times 52, that's 15,522 people for a total of $64,688. Hmm. I'm calling this next one, make your own food at home or get invited to a family or friend's house to eat. The illustration is just cut out one fast food meal per week. Fast food has got more expensive. On average, the sale is $24 right now, $24 times 52, times 100, is $124,800 that could just be given because people cut out a meal, and maybe you cut out a meal and you start fasting and praying more for what we want to do. In our new brochure, you'll be seeing also a giving tree. But first of all, I just want to thank everyone who's been giving to the project. We have children who've been giving to the project. We have youth that have been giving to the project, young adults, retired, everyone else in between. But everyone needs to be involved in the final push. If you haven't given or pledged and you're a member of this church, there's a problem. It's a heart condition that I'm going to talk more about next week. Because if God has prospered you, he calls you to be a good steward of the resources that you have to give so that his work can continue. As a friend of mine used to say, do your giving while you're living so you know where it's going. Maybe you have too much debt. We want to help you with that too. We have people that can help you with that and deal with that kind of thing. See, our culture is a buying, selling, and debt cycle economy. That's what it is. In Christ, when we come to know Jesus Christ, we are in a giving and receiving economy because God meets our needs. And as a result of faithful giving, God protects and provides for his people. And that is so countercultural to what our world says that you need to do. Maybe you have some relationships that are strained. We're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about spiritual revival and, and our theme for the year. But, you know, I, I just put together, along with the campaign team, uh, just a giving tree to reach the 1.6 million. Whether it's 
coffee sacrifice or food sacrifice or, or just giving. We only need one gift of $1.6 million. If you know somebody who has that, that means the rest of us can give and wipe out the need for a mortgage or two gifts of 800000 I like this one. Three gifts of $533,333.33. 50 gifts of $32,000. 100 gifts of $16,000. Or this one too that kind of lines up with what we started out with, uh, each seat costing $5,000 in our original plan. We need 300 gifts of $5,333.33. Or 500 gifts of $3,200. Or 1,000 gifts of $1,600. 5,000 gifts of $320. Or 10,000 gifts of $160. So, God says that he has put you somewhere on that giving tree. And last week in Acts 11, we looked at kind of the three qualities of a healthy church. They reach out to lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They disciple the believers to follow Christ with their whole heart. And they care for one another's needs and the needs around them. And the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. And remember when Allison brought together the, that phrase, pray, listen, and give. And there are three ways that people can give to our church, three categories. One is just in our general giving. And did you know how God supplied for us just in our general giving over these last number of months? It's been incredible what God has done. Also, our building fund. You can designate money there. And then we also have a benevolent fund. And over the last number of months and through all COVID, we gave thousands of dollars away and just help people. We don't go too public with it. We don't shoot video of it. We just find out needs and we just quietly look after them. And that's what we do because that's what we do as a church. Our church needs this new base of kind of missional and ministry operations on this property. And if our church is just one of, let's just say, for, for lack of a better number, 20 evangelical Bible-believing churches in Oxford County. There's about 120,000, and, and maybe Will will correct me on that, in this county. Divided by 20 means that our parish size is 6,000 people. 6,000. And if we took a poll in here today, and every one of you could write down neighbors or family that live in Oxford County or friends, I am sure that we could come up with 6,000 people very clearly that we need to start praying for and even outreach to. In a few moments, I'm going to call you to prayer. And this is an idea my wife came up with, and I thought it was an excellent idea. Some of us are just going to go out. We're going to walk by all the food. We're just going to walk out to a place out there, have two or three people pray for the project, for the ministry of our church over the next few months, for the unity of the Spirit of God, and that God would just pour out his blessing upon us. So we're going to walk out there. Those of you who don't want to walk across the parking lot, Brian, our chair of our elders board, and Jay are going to be here just leading a time of prayer for you as well. But I believe that God wants to do something immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine in our ministry and in our life. And it's just not about the money. This is really about our spiritual lives. All summer, part of my studies was just looking at revival and renewal and regeneration in the church. And next week's message is going to talk about that because I believe that not only what God has done in my own heart this summer, he wants to do some things in our hearts 
to bring healing in families and marriages. He wants to do some things in your heart and my heart that we can only explain by this is what God has done in my life, that he's going to lead us and guide us because a relationship with Jesus Christ changes everything. That's what we're about. That's why we are here. We exist to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray and I'll give you some instructions as we walk together and pray together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for your blessing to us. As we pray, as we walk together, as we seek you, Lord, just like you opened up the skies today, we ask you to open up the blessings from heaven to us as well. As one Puritan theologian said, we expect great things because we serve a great God. And so we thank you, Father, for your presence and guidance in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. So what we're going to do, Jay and Brian are going to be kind of up here at the front of the tent. And those of you who do not feel that you can walk out there, they're going to pray with you. And I'm hoping one of them will lead great is thy faithfulness. That's the last song on our sheet today. Just one verse and one chorus. And then the rest of us are going to go out. You're going to have to avoid the food. That's all there is to it. And we're just going to walk out to the parking lot. There's kind of a place there that we're just going to stand. I'm just going to ask two or three people to pray. I'll conclude in prayer. And then we're just going to sing one verse, one chorus of great is thy faithfulness. Since 1890, God's faithfulness has been upon this church. Right from Queen Victoria all the way down to Queen Elizabeth and now King Charles. Did you know that kings and queens come and go? But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's who's constant. That's who's constant. So you ready to go? Let's go.